Welcome to the second of Pitt's Theology Library Spring 2021 Kessler Conversations on the topic, Blessed are the Poor, Wealth and Poverty in the 16th and 21st Centuries. My name is Bo Adams, and I serve as director of Pitt's Theology Library, the home of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection. The Kessler Collection's mission is not merely about collecting the rare books and manuscripts that document the reformations of the 16th century. Rather, we continue to look for ways to teach from the collection, to invite our patrons to consider how these works from so long ago can inform responses to challenges that our communities and congregations face today. These Kessler conversations are one way of doing this, of inviting a leading Reformation scholar to help us understand what the reformers have to tell us about our own world. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Professor David Fink of Furman University, where he serves as Associate Professor of Religion. A PhD graduate of Duke University, Professor Fink's teaching and research focus on wealth and poverty in the Reformation, as well as the reception of scripture and the church fathers in the 16th century. His current work is on the reception of the wisdom literature in the Reformation period, and he's the author of the volume in the Reformation Commentary on Scripture series focused on Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Today, he joins us to discuss wealth, work, and wisdom in early modern society. So Professor Fink, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be here. So before we get started, I want to remind our live audience that we welcome your questions and time permitting, I will relay them to Professor Fink. So as you have questions throughout our conversation, feel free to enter them into the Q&A section of the site. And if we have time at the end, I will try to get to those. But I wanna start Professor Fink with a very broad question and simply ask if you can help us understand your own research agenda and to provide us a sense of why you think it's important to study this period in general, and particularly why it's important to study wealth and poverty conversations from the 16th century. And as you do so, how do you invite students to make that big jump from 500 years ago up to consider the relevance of these documents for today? Yeah. All right. Well, those are great questions and a great way to start our conversation. So thank you. And once again, thanks for the invitation. And um, I'm, I'm honored to be here and excited to talk a little bit about the research I do and the teaching, which which for me really, uh, really intersect with one another. Um, I teach at a liberal arts uh, college, which is a little bit different from being at a, at a big university um, in, in the sense that uh, our teaching and our research we, we really see as, um, as growing organically out of one another. So, um, you know, in my in my my research and my writing, I'm always thinking about how this is going to, uh, you know, how I can use this for my students and help them understand the material and the time period um, that, that has captivated my interest and in professional uh, energy so much. Um, when it comes to the um, the 16th century, uh, you know, the, the the period that we're looking at here, the the late Middle Ages and the early modern era, as scholars call it, um, I think. Um, there are really big important shifts going on. And, and they're, they're, at least for the purposes of our conversation, there, there are two really big, massive shifts that are, that are happening quickly in, in European society this time. On the one hand, you've got a massive shift in religion. Um, and you know, this, of course, we know is the Reformation, uh, the fragmentation or the breakup of a unified institutional religious culture that had for over a thousand years characterized Western Europe. This is probably what most of uh, most of your your viewers, people turning in for a talk like this, are going to be more familiar with: Luther posting the ninety five theses, uh, Calvin reforming the city of Geneva, the the, the radical reformers, etc. Um, but at the same time that this is going on, there, there's also another really important shift going on um, at the level of economy and the ways in which goods and services are produced, um, the way in which economic exchange is transacted. And historians of this period who work on economic history, um, you know, pinpoint the 16th century as being really critical in the emergence of a, of a more modern market-based economy, um, um, a more capital-oriented economy. So, um, you know, my view is that these things are not accidental. Um, there have been lots of books written about this, lots of arguments of, you know, that oftentimes kind of end up being kind of chicken and egg arguments. But, but the reality is, is that the, the, the kind of modern market-based, capital-based economy that, 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 that begins to start looking more like the kind of economy that we live in today is, is starting to come on the scene in the 16th century at the same time that um, the, the, the institutional church, the Catholic church is, is cracking apart and we have new 
um, new expressions of Christianity uh, in Lutheranism and the Reformed tradition and in other more radical traditions at the same time. And these, these developments are all interrelated to one another. Um, now, you know, when, when I teach these classes here, in fact, for, for uh, the last several years here at Furman, um, I've taught a class called Wealth and Poverty in the Christian Tradition, which um, seeks to, um, to, to look at the ways in which uh, faithful Christians in different eras have, have sought to understand the phenomenon of, of money and worldly goods and possessions, our, our ethical obligations to those who have less than us, and and how Christian faith is brought to bear in shaping um, economic life. Um, and in teaching that class, the Reformation period has always had um, a, a kind of pivotal, pivotal um, role in the narrative that, that I develop in the class. Um, but I think one of the, the really important ways in which this is beneficial for students is that it takes us, by, by looking at history that's a little bit further away from us, um, we can get outside some of the, the kind of entrenched positions um, that, that characterize modern politics today, right? Um, you know, are you for capitalism or against capitalism? Well, you know, th those kinds of questions oftentimes kind of break down on, um, you know, familiar political and even theological lines um, uh, uh, in the 21st century. But when you start asking these kinds of questions about the role of markets and the role of, of, of individual agency and what kind of obligation do we have to the poor, either as individuals or as a society, um, they just don't break down in the 16th century the way they do for us. And that, that opens up space, I think, for students from lots of different backgrounds to look at these questions with new eyes and see them in a different perspective and maybe realize that the tradition they're a part of, that they identify with, um, uh, has actually thought through these things in a really different way than than it does than it does now. I I think a really, a really helpful way for me to understand that was an article that you wrote in 2016, um, an essay in the journal Modern Theology, and and there you looked at the reformers' understanding of this idea of renunciation of wealth, of individuals giving up their own wealth. Yeah. But you traced it through history, right? So you looked at the story of the rich young ruler in the New Testament Gospels. And then you looked at how the church had received that story. So as a way of understanding kind of the development of renunciation, can you help us understand that story as it appears in the Gospels and then look at how it was traced through the early church and into the medieval period as this idea of should individuals themselves give up their own wealth as Christians? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. And, and it's a question. it's a question that has been in the back of my mind for years and years. I mean, I, I remember the first time uh, the first time I really thought about this in, in any kind of serious way was was when I was an undergraduate and and had the opportunity to go um, uh, on a teaching trip to to Thailand. And uh, Thailand is a country that has um, a, a, a you know a, a significant population of of, of renunciants of monks. I've seen people walk the streets in you know barefoot in a, 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 in a saffron robe with, with a bowl begging their, their their daily bread and wondering asking myself the question. Why don't we see this in our society? Um, you know, the, the, the role of the renunciant, I mean, we have, we have, we have homeless people who are the, the involuntary poor, um, and that, that's a problem that gets picked up in the 16th century, but, but voluntary poverty, individuals renouncing their worldly goods and, and living a very minimalistic life um, is, is something that is, you know, really kind of beyond the pale of experience for most people. So I've, I've, I've always had an interest in that question. Um, and I think for a lot of people, um, the passage that really focuses debate or focuses our, our theological attention in, in the Gospels is the, the story of the rich young ruler. So that's the story of, of a young man. He's, he's called a ruler in Luke's version, but, but in, in, in the Synoptic Gospels, he's a young man who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, and, and Jesus gives him a very hard answer. He says, um, you know, if you would be perfect, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And, and his, you know, his disciples are astonished by this. Well, you know, who can do this? Um, and then this is also the place where Jesus, um, you know, gives one of his most famous, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if you want to call it an analogy or a hyperbole, but this is the, 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 the camel passing through the eye of a needle, right? Um, so as I started studying the reception history of this, text. Um, what I expected to find, what I expected to find is that very early in the church, people interpreted this literally. And then over time, that kind of literal interpretation gets eroded and gets softened. And that's not, that's not exactly what I found. Um, 
the the earliest the earliest interpreters that we can find in the tradition that really engage with this text in any detail um, are are not reading it in necessarily a straightforward literal way. Um, they're already already in the second century in a figure like Clement of Alexandria. They're they're spiritualizing the text. And as I started looking at the history of interpretation, um, it seemed to me that, that strategies for interpreting this text kind of up through the Reformation fall into one of two basic camps. Um, you, can, you can apply Jesus' command, sell your, you sell your goods and give it to the poor. You can apply it universally, but then you have to kind of soften it or spiritualize it, right? So um, a writer like Clement of Alexandria will say, um, you know, Jesus is not talking about literally selling your possessions. What he's talking about is, di is, is divesting yourself of the spiritual vices that cling to your soul, right? So, so greed, um, you know, if, if, if your soul has an inordinate desire for worldly possessions, you've, you've got to shunt that off and get rid of it. So, so this applies to everybody, but it might apply to people in different ways, right? So one person might have a problem with greed. One person might have a problem with lust. One person might have a problem with, you know, with, 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 gluttony. Um, so the idea is, it applies to everybody who applies to people in different ways, right? So that, that, that's one strategy. The second strategy, and, and this, this develops a little bit later with the rise of monasticism in the, the third and the fourth centuries, especially in the fourth century. You'll see writers like Basil of Caesarea or Jerome, um, who are, are going to interpret this command of Christ much more literally. They're going to say, no, when Jesus says sell all your possessions, he means sell all your possessions. But they're going to say, this, doesn't, th th this is not a command that applies to everybody. This is what's called a council of perfection. Okay? So, so this distinction gets developed throughout the, the, the patristic period, the period of the early church, that, that there's a sort of baseline level of, 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 of moral rectitude that, that should characterize the life of all Christians, right? So this would be like the Ten Commandments, um, you know, the, the, the sort of basic moral normative teaching of the, uh, of the Torah um, and, and the Sermon on the Mount. But for those who want to go above and beyond, who want to press on to spiritual perfection in this lifetime and not just wait for it in the life of the world to come, um, this is the kind of second level or, 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 or next step that you take to, to hasten yourself along that road, right? So... The monastic interpreters will say, um, you know, the, the, the rich young ruler who, who goes away sad, he goes away sad, not because he's damned and he's, he's, he's you know, he's going to go to hell. He, he just, he realizes that, you know, he didn't have enough to be, he didn't have what was in him to, uh, you know, to renounce everything um, and attain spiritual perfection. So, you know, th those, those two basic interpretive strategies, you, you find kind of side by side throughout the interpretive literature, I, I would argue all throughout the Middle Ages. Um, you know, uh, either you, you, you've got to kind of soften it one way or another, either by, by spiritualizing it or by restricting its application to a, a kind of spiritual elite. Um, but what, what everybody prior to the Reformation agrees on, and I, I'd say there, there are kind of two, two, two ways you can sum this up. What, what everybody agrees on, one, is that, that money, money is hazardous to your soul, right? Um, there's, there's just something about money that, that, that has a kind of gravitational pull toward it. Um, and and you've, you've got to be careful with it. You've got to be careful with it. Now, now some of the writers like, like Clement of Alexandria, for example, will use um, um, a, a, a term that they, they actually take from Stoic philosophy. Um, the word is adiaphoron, which means an, an indifferent thing. And, and Clement will say, you know, the problem is not with money itself. The problem is with, with you know, your own, you know, spiritual problems, the, the, the malformation of your soul. Um, but yet, Clement will also talk about money as though it's something that has a spiritual weight to it. You've got to, you know, divest yourself of, of, of goods so that your, you know, your soul can rise up to God. Um, and, and, and that's an assumption, I think, that up until the time of the Reformation, pretty much everybody writing on this stuff in, in Christian circles, the ones that I've looked at in the West, agrees on this. Um, the, other, the other piece that is really important um, is, is what's sometimes called redemptive almsgiving. The idea that financial capital can be converted into spiritual capital. Um, 
that that by giving, um, you know, by 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 directly giving to those who are in need, or by giving to the church, um, that you're 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 accruing merit in heaven. And and you know this this arises from a I think a fairly straightforward reading of some of those passages in the Gospels where Jesus says things like sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. So um, I I brought a picture along and maybe now would be a good time to share it if we see if we can make this work here. I got my the slide button. Can we see that? I see it. I see it. Okay, good. So um, what we're looking at here is an illustration from um, an English breviary, that is a prayer book, that was uh, produced sometime in the 15th century. And, and I think this, this picture just kind of um, really crystallizes for me the, 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 the medieval mindset when it comes to almsgiving. You see up, up at the top of the screen, you've got Christ and the saints uh, in, in, in glory, ensconced in heaven. It's got a big wall around it. And we've, we've got a, a sort of pulley and tackle system, right? Where on the right-hand side, you see this bucket and it's full of people. And um, if, if you can't read the caption, it, it says, and this is, this is um, early modern English, it says, ye souls are dragged up out of purgatory by prayer and alms deeds. And then on the left-hand side of your screen, you see priests offering uh, the Eucharistic sacrifice and the mass. And then immediately below them, you see a lay person handing bread to beggars, right? And, and it says alms deed in the caption there. Um, and I think this, this really kind of nicely symbolizes the kind of spiritual economy that is in play on the eve of the Reformation, right? Pri- priests and the clergy have their job to do, um, you know, performing religious rituals, performing the mass. Lay people have their job to do in offering alms, in, in giving aid to those who are in need. And, and this, n- not only is it good for your own soul, but it's good for the souls of others as well. You, 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 you literally are, 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 are buying their souls and dragging them up out of purgatory. And, and you know, this model has deep roots in, in the Middle Ages and the patristic period. And this is the kind of way of looking at and thinking about salvation that, that the Protestant reformers in the 16th century are going to react against. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's... So interesting. I mean, in our modern context, we tend to talk about wealth as untapped potential to do good, right? Mm-hmm. Why hold on to your wealth when right. you can do good? I think the point you raise, which is so important, is this idea of spiritual liability, that wealth itself, regardless of what you could do with it, can in some ways be a hindrance to your own uh, progress or your own uh, salvation. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, naturally, you you talk about the Reformation as a rereading of this renunciation tradition. So the obvious question becomes, how did Luther and followers of Luther choose one of these sides or kind of reinterpret the debate about what individual renunciation might mean? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. What, what, what I found when I started looking at how the reformers are interpreting this story is, is, is there, there's both continuity and there's discontinuity. I, I mean, the, 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 biggest, the biggest discontinuity is that the, 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 the Protestant reformers pretty much to a person, as far as I can, as far as I can discern, um, are unanimous in rejecting this model of redemptive almsgiving, right? This idea that, um, that, that in a sense, you're, you're, you're earning or buying your way into salvation. Now, you know, a, a lot of the patristic and medieval rhetoric, you know, kind of, you know, exploits this metaphor in, in very strike, you know, very striking ways. Um, you know, Clement, again, will, will urge his hearers, you know, you know, um, you know, buy buy your soul by means of your money. You know, hate, make, make hasten to the marketplace to conclude this transaction, right? I mean, he's, he, you know, and, and, and part of it, I think, is just a sort of flair for rhetoric. The, 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 the reformers are just really allergic to anything that resembles this. And, hmm. and this, of course, is going to stem from their understanding of justification, uh, justification coming by faith alone, right? So, you know, the idea, the idea being that um, um, your alms do not um, establish you in a right relationship with God. They, they are the fruit and the product of, of, of that already having taken place. Okay. So, so faith is the thing, you know, in, in, in Luther's, um, in, you know, in, in Luther's account, faith is like the, the, the wedding ring that binds the soul to Christ. Um, and, and once that union has been made, once the soul has been united to Christ through faith, um, then everything that Christ has and is becomes yours 
in this um, uh, uh, this 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 transaction, if you will. Um, Luther is confident that once you realize what what God has done for you in Christ, that the, the sort of natural response is going to be an outflowing of generosity on the horizontal plane, right? Um, once I realize that I don't have to earn my way into heaven by by almsgiving, Luther thinks, I I am you know, ha having been filled with the Holy Spirit and, and united to Christ, I, I'm going to overflow in a life of good works and, and deeds of love uh, to my neighbors. And, and Luther seems to think that this is going to happen rather spontaneously. Um, I think by the time you get into the second and third generations of Protestant culture after Luther, there's a little, little bit more realism that's set in. And, you know, people are starting to realize, well, you know, maybe maybe there's some helpful nudges we can give people, <laughs> you know, to, uh, um, you know, encourage them in this. But the, the basic Protestant conviction is that alms don't buy your way into heaven. Um, alms don't rack up merit. They're, they're, they're always going to be allergic to this language. Um, but alms are still a necessary and important part of the Christian life as, as the outflow and the product of that of that faith. Um, the, the, the thing where... Um, I think the, the Protestant reformers are maybe a bit more in, in line with the, the pre-Reformation tradition um, is, is on this suspicion of money as, as harmful to your spiritual health. But, but among them, there, there, there are definitely differences of emphasis. So um, Luther seems to be more optimistic. Um, Luther seems to think that as long as you don't set your heart on money, um, go ahead and enjoy it. Um, Luther seems to have a more kind of earthy, world affirming, this worldly kind of view of the relationship between the Christian and, and money and material goods. Um, so as long as it's not a problem, as long as you can handle it, you know, God has given you these blessings, you might as well enjoy them. Um, Calvin, as I read him, is much closer to the view of somebody like Clement of Alexandria, who, who will say, you know, in theory, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the money, it's you that's the problem. But but Calvin thinks, Calvin thinks that anyone who's got money, he says, you, you look around and, you know, the people who have the most money are the people who are the most greedy and grasping. And, and, and that's not an accident, right? There, there is something about money that distorts your perception, your, 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 your perception of reality and the need of other people. And so, you know, uh, you know this, this goes beyond just exegesis and theology, but, but in places like Calvin's Geneva, where where, you know, the Reformation is really implemented, um, you know, in a lot of ways very thoroughly, um, you know, they have things like sumptuary laws, laws that restrict, um, you know, ostentatious, uh, ostentatious displays of wealth. Um, because I think there's a recognition that these things ha have a really distorting effect, um, not only on the individual soul, but on the social fabric as well. It's interesting that you mentioned the justification piece. We we met with uh, Esther Chung Kim, whom I know you have worked with. Uh, we were talking about care for the poor, and there again, the the there's a tension right between this idea of your works don't justify you, and yet asking people to do things to support society and to care for the poor. So right. similarly, you you might ask, how can you tell someone to give up his or her wealth when in fact we've already decided that what one does has no role in the ultimate salvation of the soul. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in a lot of ways, Protestantism um, aligns well with that strand of pre-modern thinking that, that, you know, universalizes the command and says, well, you know, look, this, this does apply to everybody. This is not, you know, not applying only to a spiritual elite. Um, but, but, you know, if you're going to do that, then, you know, it, it's going to be, it, it comes at the expense of the kind of radicalness of Jesus' claim, right? And, you know, I think that's one way in which, and this this kind of gets back to, um, you know, the question I started with at the beginning that I was thinking about, you know, visiting Thailand as an undergraduate. Right? Well, why don't why don't we see this? Well, the answer is is that, you know, we we live in a a society that's been deeply shaped by Protestant mores, um, and Protestantism has just not had a prominent place for the individual renunciant, right? The the individual to make this grand gesture of, you know, you know. Think, 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 Saint Francis, <laughs> you know, in the in the in the town square of Assisi, right? You know, stripping off his clothing and handing it back to his father, and and naked following the naked Christ. I mean, that 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 kind of gesture is just very alien, I think, to 
Protestant culture to a Protestant mindset. But but that doesn't mean that Protestants don't believe in 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 all the you know all the places in Scripture where you know care and generosity for the poor are are commended and commanded. Um, so w- what it means is is they, they they rethink the basis of this and you know um, they, they they toss when they toss out this old model of redemptive almsgiving, it it forces a th- it forces a sort of rethinking of the theological basis for um, for almsgiving and for care to the poor. I mean, you, you can't just say, you know, we're going to stop giving alms because that's a Catholic thing, because alms are just all over the Bible, right? I mean, it's just, um, you know, especially in the body of material that I've been working in more recently in the wisdom literature. I mean, it's just, it's just ubiquitous. Um, so I think what happens is, is when you, when you toss out this model of a kind of one-for-one transaction where my gift to a poor person is going to accrue merit to me, you've got to start thinking, okay, if we're not doing it for this reason, then why are we doing it? I mean, they're going to, they're going to end up at the same place. I mean, Protestants are still giving to the poor. Protestants are still, you know, deeply concerned with works of charity, but they're, they're, they're refounding it on a new basis. So part of it is, you know, what we've already touched on this idea that, you know, if you have true justifying faith, like it's, it's, it's going to, it's going to show, right. Um, you can, if, 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 you, if you're concerned about, you know, for example, this is especially acute in the reformed tradition, if you're, if you're, if you're concerned about whether, uh, you know, you are one of the elect or, or you, you know, the, the kind of faith you have is the, 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 the justifying faith that saves. Well, one, one kind of index you can get of that is your own generosity. Um, but, you know, I think it goes beyond this as well in that in going back to the sources and you know i mean if if the reformation is anything it is a it is a return to the sources of christian faith and christian teaching in the early church and especially of course in scripture um it 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 reforce it 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 reconfigures um you know or, or or i should say protestants end up focusing on certain texts particularly in the old testament or hebrew bible um that oftentimes open up the possibility for a more social dimension to, um, to, to giving and generosity. So, for example, Protestants are really impressed um, uh, from a very early period by uh, that passage in Deuteronomy 15 that says, you know, that there shall be no poor among you. Um, you know, you've got some of the earlier, more radical reformers, like Andreas uh, von Karlstadt, one of you know, Luther's uh, one-time associates, um, you know, sort of drawing this conclusion, like, look, if we're, we're we're going to reform this society and have a really Christian society. Then, then one way we can know if we've done that is we don't have poor people anymore, um, because we're taking care of them. Because the the, the structures are in place. Um, you see this in a lot of the Swiss cities as well, in Zurich and Geneva. Um, you know, poverty goes from being, um, you know, something that is that that is at least the potential for. Uh, a life of p- peculiar holiness, voluntary poverty, you know, they get rid of that. Um, but then, you know, there's this sense of, well, let's, let's roll up our sleeves and figure out how we can do away with this together. And so you have, you know, I think in the, 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 the late 15th and early 16th centuries, you have some of the first concerted efforts to address systemic poverty and, and people actually asking themselves, well, what would it look like to live in a society where we didn't have poor people because we took care of them all? Um, and, and then that's an idea that, you know, you, you can trace right into the modern era. Well, I wanted to turn, I mean, you mentioned scriptural interpretation. Um, it's, I suspect was a natural progression to go from studying poverty to go to the wisdom literature because the wisdom literature just flows with language about the poor person. Um, that's by right. the way, for our audience, the wisdom literature is a term we typically use to describe texts like Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, these more kind of instructional texts where you do have this language about how the ideal person is to live or not to live. So what was the uh, mode of interpreting some of those texts amongst the reformers? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I, I've been, for the last five or six years, I've been really immersed in this body of literature um, as, as part of this, uh, this, this series that InterVarsity is doing, the Reformation Commentary on Scripture. And one of the aims of that, of that series is to take um, biblical scholarship interpretation that that has usually not been accessible to a non-specialist audience, which usually means people who don't read Latin, um, and 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 make that more widely available. And given my own teaching and research interests in the history of poverty, that was that was a natural place for me to go. 
Um, I, I've, I, I've seen one uh, modern biblical scholar describe the book of Proverbs as, as, as containing, you know, verse for verse. It's, it's the most dense with material having to do with economic and um, um, uh, material, material affairs. And, and it's true. I mean, it's just, it's just all over the place. Um, so, you know, what I've found as I've, you know, been, been reading through commentaries and sermons and other places where the reformers engage with this is, you know, th there are a lot of places where there's a lot of continuity with the medieval tradition. Um, you know, for example, um, one, one sort of class or category of Proverbs where you'd have a hard time telling a, a Protestant from, you know, a, a medieval or an early church um, commentator would be the cluster of Proverbs that, that condemn avarice and greed. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the 16th century Protestant reformers are not Alvin, are not uh, Adam Smith. Uh, greed is not good. Um, they, they are unambiguous in, in condemning greed and for the most part affirming what, what I would call um, an ethic of sufficiency. So, you know, think of a proverb like, um, neither poverty nor riches, just give me my daily bread. Um, Protestants are going to expound a proverb like that, you know, in, in much the same way that, you know, people in any period prior to have been. You know, there, there, there's, there's a danger with having too much wealth. There's obviously a danger with having too little. Um, God has provided a, an abundance of material goods for our health and for our comfort. Um, but, but beyond that, you, you know, you need to be thinking in terms of what you can do to help those who are less fortunate. Um, but, but there certainly are other passages and other kind of clusters of proverbs, um, that are starting to get uh, reinterpreted in different ways. Okay. So, um, you know, a, a proverb like Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 19, 17, um, you know, the, the one who is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. And the Lord will surely repay him. You know, in in the Middle Ages, um, a proverb like that fits very neatly into the model of redemptive almsgiving, right? You know, I give this money to a poor person. I'm not really giving it to the poor person. I'm giving it to God, and I'm expecting a payback that is going to come, you know, beyond this life, either in reduced time in purgatory or, um, you know, in some other way. Um, you know, Protestants are are they want to affirm that um that 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 these kinds of transactions occur within um a moral order that God has established um they they will say you know of, of course when you give to the poor um you know this this is a good work that God is going to reward but 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 that's a sort of something that takes place after over and above um, what is established by faith in, in justification, right? So, um, you know, there, there is a doctrine of proportional rewards among some of the Protestant reformers. Um, some of them will read it, so, you know, sim simply in terms of the sort of um, moral structure of, you know, how human society and the human psychology is, is, is established, right? I mean, people who are habitually generous get a reputation for being generous and people like them and they respond well. So, I mean, there's, there, there are different ways of, of parsing it. Um, you know, they're still going to interpret it as, you know, a, a strong, um, you know, moral impulse to generosity, but they're just going to have to tweak it in certain ways. Um, you know, the passages uh, against usury, condemnations of usury are, are beginning to be understood a little bit differently. And, you know, people sometimes want to, um, you know, um, blame the, 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 the demise of the, the, the Christian um, uh, uh, prohibition of usury on Protestantism, which is, which is not accurate. Um, you know, th that, that norm had been eroded for several centuries already. But, but um, you know, you do see Protestants beginning to kind of make this a little bit more explicit when it comes to some of these proverbs and, and making distinctions, right? You know, it's one thing to take advantage of a poor person by charging interest on, you know, to somebody who's in desperate need. Um, but it may be a different thing to charge interest on a loan to an investor who's, you know, looking to, to increase their business. Those, those might be differences we can, we can make a distinction on. So, so you're starting to see, you know, on some of those practical questions, Protestants are beginning to read some of these proverbs a bit different. Well, I, I, you mentioned Adam Smith, you mentioned greed is good. So I want to switch <laughs> to our American context, uh, where in many ways, wealth possessions 
are now signs of success and hard work, right? So we, we, we praise the person who has accumulated a lot on the assumption that he or she um, has worked hard. And of course, interestingly, we often refer to this as the Protestant work ethic. So I'm curious how you see that. Is that, is that a fair reading of the Protestants or have we kind of stretched that idea because it seems pretty far from the, the way you're describing wealth uh, 500 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think you're right, Bo. I mean, we, we've, um, you know, part of this is just the sort of wild success of a, of a very particular academic argument um, that some, some of your viewers may be familiar with, with Max Weber, the, the, the famous German sociologist and scholar of religion, his, his essay, The Protestant Ethic and Spirit of Capitalism. Um, you know, one of these arguments, you know, it's, it's one of these academic arguments that has almost been too successful in the sense of like a, a sort of, you know, it's, it's been a victim of its own success. Um, you know, Weber's argument was very nuanced and he was deeply immersed in certain certain of the sources. And um, but, you know, in, in the kind of popular perception, when people talk about the Protestant work ethic, right, it's this almost sort of, sort of neurotic drive to to be, you know, to be working all the time. Um, and, and, you know, I think a, as a cultural phenomenon, I think it's unarguable that, that our culture has valorized work itself, um, as being in, in some ways the, the, the highest of the worldly virtues. Um, you know, I, I, um, you know, thinking back to my, my own family background, um, you know, I, my, my grandparents who, who grew up during the great depression, um, you know, were um, nominal Presbyterians. Um, the, the the highest compliment that um, my grandparents would would give somebody was to say that they were a hard worker. You know, so and so, oh, they're 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 hard workers. Um, you know, that was tantamount to you know honesty, integrity, um, you know, probity. Um, you know, the, the 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 backstory on that with the Reformation is is long and tangled. Um, but you know. Weber's argument has to do with the point I made a little bit earlier about how with in the Protestant understanding of justification, the relationship between faith and works is reversed from the Catholic model, right? Instead of being, instead of works being the thing that draw you closer to God, works are the things that show that you've been drawn closer to God. But, but in the lives of at least some Protestants, you know, there, there, there is a certain uncertainty. That 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 model introduces, or, or what I would actually say is, is it is it reconfigures the uncertainty, it, it rearranges it. So, on the Catholic model, um, you know, you receive justifying grace through the sacraments, you cooperate with that grace in striving toward spiritual perfection. The uncertainty in the Catholic model is always in the future, right? And the uncertainty is, I can I can commit a mortal sin, remove myself from a state of grace, and die outside of grace, and my soul can be lost. Right. So that that's that's the kind of uncertainty um, of salvation that I have at a sort of individual subjective level. Protestantism removes that, at least at least in certain versions of Protestantism. Weber's looking at it, you know, in, in the Reformed tradition, you know, you're, you're predestined, you're justified. Justification is a once for all deal. It can't be undone. You don't you don't go in and out of a state of grace the way you do in the Catholic model. Um, but instead of being worried about, you know, I might commit a moral sin and lose grace, the, the worry in the Protestant model is maybe, maybe I didn't really believe to begin with, right? Like maybe, maybe the faith I have was, you know, because there's, there's false faith, right? There, there's some people, you know, they call it presumption. Um, um, you know, people, people who believe or believe in the wrong way, or, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not elect. How do you know? And, you know, I think it's probably always a subset of, of, uh, Christians within these categories, you know, there's, there's at least the possibility for a certain, you know, inward looking neurotic concern about, well, how do I know that I'm elect? Um, well, one way you do that is by, by, you know, looking at your life. Are you, are you, do you give generously to the poor? Um, so, you know, Weber makes the argument that, um, and, and I think, you know, in some ways this is, this is an overstatement. Um, but, but Weber makes the argument that, that this leads to a kind of neurotic, obsession about good works. We're not trying to earn our way into salvation. We're trying to prove to ourselves that we have been saved. Um, so, you know, and, and so, so Weber argues that this is, this is where this idea of a kind of, you know, viewing, viewing your, uh, your work in, in worldly, um, you know, your worldly vocation, your worldly profession uh, as, as being service to God, 
right? I mean, you know, you you may be you may be called to you know work at McDonald's, um, and and you know, in Luther's telling, um, you know, that is that is just as holy as being a monk and saying masses, um, you know, as long as you do it in the right spirit, right? So so it infuses the idea is that it infuses all of you know secular um, vocations with with uh, with 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 a spiritual dimension. Um, Weber thinks that this also leads to, you know, a sort of obsessive, um, you know, uh, um, uh, you know yeah, an, an obsessive view of work, right? You're, you're trying to prove to yourself that you've been saved. I, I think when you actually look at the literature, though, that that's that that really is in some ways an overstatement. And one of the places where I think you see this most most clearly is in Protestant um, uh, uh, interpretation of the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. Um, you know, um, one of the, the sources that I found most interesting and, and at times even funny, um, illuminating, uh, in certainly illuminating in, in my work has been Philip Melanchthon's commentary on the Proverbs. You know, Melanchthon was Luther's right-hand man in Wittenberg. Um, and, um, Melanchthon reads the Proverbs through the lens of a, a, a kind of Aristotelian virtue ethics. And so, um, you know, for those of you who may not be familiar with Aristotle or, or his account of ethics, you know, um, virtuous behavior is always, is always the golden mean between two extremes, right? So, um, you know, courage is the, the, the midpoint between cowardice and rashness. Um, and when, when um, Melanchthon approaches the Proverbs, he, he, he wants to read the Proverbs as a sort of primer on Christian virtue. You know, Romans and Galatians are going to tell you about how you get saved on the vertical axis. And Proverbs is going to tell you how to live your life on the horizontal axis. It's going to give you like very practical guidance and modeling for, for how you interact with people, what you do with your money, um, you know, how you serve God faithfully in your vocation. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the kind of clusters of Proverbs that I found really interesting in Melanchthon's interpretation is the, the, the Proverbs that I, I still remember from my childhood, um, you know, my parents, had, my, you know, my, my mother would see me sitting down on the job and it was, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider its ways and be wise, right? Well, most, most medieval and frankly, even most Protestant interpreters look at that and, you know, insofar as that requires any elaboration, you know, it's going to be finger wagging at lazy people, you know, don't be lazy, be like the ants. Melanchthon comes along and he says, okay, yeah, being lazy is bad. You don't want to be lazy. But, but that's one extreme, right? What, what is the opposite extreme of laziness? Um, and Melanchthon says, uh, he actually, he, he, he doesn't have a word at hand for this. So he coins one. He, he, it's, it's, it's a Greek portmanteau word, uh, polypragmasune, which I translate as being a busybody, uh, many workedness, right? Um, Melanchthon says the, you know, he spends a lot more time excoriating people who have this frenetic need to be working all the time. You can't sit still and just be in the presence of God. You, you, you've got to be doing something all the time, all the time, right? Um, the, the, an, another place where, where for Melanchthon, this, this term crops up is in, is in Luke chapter 10, the story of Mary and Martha. Um, you remember Jesus goes into the, the home of Mary and Martha, and Martha's the one who's, you know, juggling all the pots and pans and getting the dinner on the table. Mary's the one just sitting at his feet, adoring Christ. Um, medieval interpreters had, had oftentimes read that as, as illustrating the difference between lay life and monastic life, right? Lay people are the ones who you know, build the roads and farm the fields and get stuff done. They don't have much time to pray. Monks are the ones who spend all their time adoring Christ. Melanchthon comes on and says, no, that's not what it's about. It's about, um, you know, it's about people who don't have the proper balance in life. Right, the Marthas are the people who think they have to be working all the time and don't have time to just stop and worship. Um, and, and we need Melanchthon says we need to be both. You know, sometimes you need to be a Mary, sometimes you need to be a Martha. So you may be the first person to call Melanchthon's commentary on Proverbs funny, but I appreciate it, and uh, it's proof that these can be entertaining texts to read. So. Um, we're, we're running tight on time. I want to ask a couple of more questions. The first is my selfish library question. Um, yeah. Certainly during the pandemic, I think we've all kind of had to reconfigure our lives, whether that's teaching or research or, or what have you. 
Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the role that libraries have played, particularly libraries that collect materials like we do, and then how you anticipate maybe some of that shifting in light of digital technologies and uh, the pandemic that's, that's stifled travel, uh, essentially. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I think so oftentimes the work that people in, in, in academic libraries do is, is overlooked and underappreciated. But for people like me, who, you know, I mean, the, the, the projects that I've been working on for the last decade have been tracking down some of these little red and understudied sources, you know, most of which have never been translated before. Um, and, you know, if I'd been doing this work 20 years ago, the only way to do it would be, you know, to apply for funding and get on a plane and go, you know, spend, spend your time in Europe, you know, ransacking university and monastic libraries. So much of this material has been digitized right now. And it's just, it's just astonishing what you can find, um, you know, from the comfort of your own study with, with an internet connection and, you know, high resolution scans, um, you know, I mean, that, that it has just opened up, you know, this, this whole commentary project that I was talking about earlier, which would, would just be impossible without, without this work. And, you know, what it has been is, you know, you know, the mechanics of this better than I, but, um, you know, um, people just scanning the stuff and photocopying it. It's it's a laborious work, but it's an investment for the future of scholarship and for the future of our understanding of the church and the theological tradition that we care about that makes these things available and accessible to people for free. And it's it's such a gift to the world. It's a gift to scholars. And, um, you know, I, I think of my work in translating these sources and making them available for, a lay, fo for, for lay folks. It's just kind of, you know, taking the baton from, from you folks at the library and, and running the next the next leg of the race and, and getting it out to a wider audience. Um, I would also just add too that um, with a lot of these sources, um, it's opened up really great opportunities for 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 research, even for undergraduates. Um, I um, I teach a, a class here at Furman. We, a lot of a lot of us take our turn teaching the the intro Bible class, and I make my students do a, a paper on the history of interpretation, where they've got to get you know, look at how a, a text has been interpreted in different eras. And I'm oftentimes sending them to um, um, databases like Early English Books Online that have digitized, you know, thousands and thousands of these documents. And a lot of them are coming from libraries like yours. So um, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I think we all know that digitizing is one thing, but if you don't have the scholarly apparatus to interpret, then it's quite another we can all look at an image from an English breviary, but we need you alongside us to explain it to us. So uh, we appreciate that um, very much. I mean, in many ways, the pandemic has only shown us how important these digitization efforts are. That's right. And I think Reformation Studies is a great example because particularly the German libraries have been so aggressive in digitization. Um, it really, you can see it advanced scholarship and you can already see some of the rewards uh, of the work uh, that they've done. So we're running short on time. I want to ask one last question. Um, we always prepare for our audience a bibliography of resources if they want to learn more. Um, we have your work that we will highlight and certainly uh, include in the bibliography. But if someone wanted to read a little bit more about the 16th century or perhaps specifically around this topic of wealth and poverty, are there any general works that you might recommend? Yeah, well, um, you, you you had Esther on last uh, last month, and I think I think her book would be a, a great place to start. Um, I think one of the, the kind of classic books in the last generation that a lot of historians have, have referred to um, is a book by a historian named Carter Lindbergh, um, and his book is called Beyond Charity. Um, I, I've used this in my teaching a number of times, and Lindbergh, Lindbergh really advances the argument that, that um, Reformation attitudes to wealth and poverty are, are pushing back against this model of redemptive almsgiving. Um, one other book that I think is kind of helpful read alongside that one is, is a, um, a more recent work by a Catholic biblical scholar named Gary Anderson. Um, and he wrote a book called Charity, The Place of the Poor in the Biblical Tradition. And, and he's, he's one of the scholars who's really done a lot of the kind of um, archaeology, you know, going all the way back to Second Temple Judaism and looking at the emergence of um, this, this, uh, this idea of redemptive almsgiving. Um, in you know old uh, you know pre New Testament texts like like Tobit and Ben Sira and then tracing it through the New Testament the early church period and I think those two books read together um, really kind of um, it, it, you get a nice kind of conversation one from a Catholic perspective and one from a Protestant perspective 
Um, but I think a, a really kind of helpful way of framing that topic. And I, I'd say that those, those two books are a really good place to start. Well, thank you very much. We'll certainly include those uh, on the bibliography. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time. I know we had a couple of questions that we're not going to be able to get to, but I'll pass those along to uh, Professor Fink. So, uh, David, thank you so much, not only for your insight here, but your scholarship, which has taught me a lot, uh, and I look forward to continuing to learn more. Uh, I want to remind everybody that this is just the second of our three conversations. Uh, on Wednesday, May the 5th, we will have uh, Cynthia Mo Lobita of the Pacific School uh, of Religion. Uh, coming to talk to us uh, a little bit more about capitalism and about the way in which uh, the reformers focus on the love ethic might come into conflict with our American capitalist system, which should be an interesting conversation. Um, all this information, including this recording, will be available at pitts.emory.edu slash Kessler Conversations, and we'll follow up with an email. Otherwise, thank you, Professor Fink, for your time. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and I hope you all uh, stay well and stay safe in the coming week. Thank you.